Western Australia, a country of about a million square miles and a population of only 710,000 people, a land of contrast, a hot tropical north, a cool temperate south. To the south lies the heavily timbered country, large tracts of land suitable for agriculture awaiting development. To the southeast, the mallee and mixed scrublands, lands in a suitable rainfall area and easily cleared for wheat and pasture. Contrasting again are the treeless plains of the North Midlands. After World War II, the War Service Land Settlement Scheme was introduced throughout Western Australia to rehabilitate ex-servicemen and to develop Crown lands. Western Australia is nearly one-third of the Australian continent. The extreme width, east-west, is a thousand miles, and length, north-south, 1,480 miles. The southwestern portion is mainly agriculture and is several times the area of England. Prior to 1945, independent farmers developed the agricultural regions shown here in red. After the war, Large, partially developed estates from this area were purchased by the authority for soldier settlement. In addition, larger areas of Crown land were developed at Rocky Gully, Bokarup, Denbarka, Many Peak, Diramongat, Gardner and Iniaba, providing 1,334 farms. A vast undertaking, with operational areas widely separated. Selected Crown lands are first surveyed and soils classified before development. Land use and farm size are important factors to be determined before a farm site is completed. The land settlement authorities were greatly assisted by the Department of Agriculture and the CSIRO in determining soil deficiencies and solving other problems in new areas. The heavily timbered country of the southwest presented clearing difficulties. Sturdy Jara, Wanzu and Mary trees had to be felled. This heavy steel highball chained to two super tractors of 185 horsepower designed for heavy work was the answer. The days of sweat and toil with axe and flasher are gone. This huge steel six-ton monster drawn by two giant tractors knocking down vast forests with one fell swip Nothing is left standing, and limbs are smashed and torn off, leaving a good medium for fire. Tree dozers follow in the path of the highball, assisting the clearing. Fallen trees and debris are pushed into windrows for burning. The windrows are arranged two to three chains apart, and generally in a direction most favourable for the prevailing winds during the burning off season. The burning off operation is usually carried out one or two years after the clearing, when the timber is dry. During the burning off season, bulldozers restack unburned timber in heaps along the lines of the windrows. It is essential to thoroughly clear the land for cultivation and completely burn all unwanted timber. In the wake of the clearing process follows chaining. Heavy anchor-type chains are drawn by tractors over the ground to level it for cultivation. These chains remove any small regrowth and fill in holes made by the uprooting of trees. Ploughing is done as soon as weather conditions are suitable. Great tracts of land between the prepared windrows are turned over. Stumps, roots, and other unburnt trash are brought to the surface. The magnitude of the work demands the use of heavy single disc ploughs drawn by tractors and working sometimes seven or eight abreast.
contractors working in large gangs gather the mallee roots and stumps and pile them into heaps ready for burning. Thus, the face of the countryside is changed from timber and scrublands to farms in the making. Throughout all the seasonal operations of this vast work, the heavy machinery must be maintained in excellent repair. Depots equipped for any emergency are located at strategical points near the operational areas. Tractors and bulldozers, ploughs and seed drills, harrows and harvesters all receive attention. As the time for seeding approaches, the soil is again ploughed and harrowed. Further ploughing is often necessary to remove all crude organic matter and prepare the soil as a seed bed. The Chamberlain and Majestic heavy single disc ploughs have proved their worth in the gravelly soils as well as the light lands. A farm developed for grazing is established in pasture before the property is fenced. Most Western Australian soils require heavy applications of superphosphate. To some are added the trace elements zinc and copper. The land settlement authorities have made all pastures subterranean clover based. The black, polished clover and the light coloured Wimmera ryegrass seeds are mixed in appropriate quantities to provide a well balanced pasture. The seed drill, mechanically operated, plants the seeds and the superphosphate at the correct placement and depth. The correct pasture sowing season is limited to a short period in each year. To do this in larger areas, numerous drills and tractors are used. Subterranean clover is a legume. This valuable pasture grass not only supplies feed but ensures an adequate supply of nitrogenous compounds to the soil through fixation of atmospheric nitrogen. Various strains of the clover have been developed to suit climatic conditions. The development of farms for a large number of ex-servicemen, many of whom had little capital, necessitated the use of sound agricultural practices. The aims. Farms of high standard. Occupation as soon as practicable. And a rising level of productivity to attain financial stability for the earner. All pastures on West Australian soils need an annual top dressing of fertiliser. This is usually done in the autumn. The dropper type superphosphate spreader is one type used. In some locations, the blower type, shown here, is employed. The dragging of a tyre behind the motor truck acts as a guide for the operator and indicates where top dressing has already been applied. a precious commodity and a constant problem. Rainfall provides for pastures, but for stock, water harvesting is all important. Dams are sunk where the clay is at a reasonable depth. To fill the dams, the catchment area is roaded. Soil is raised up into mounds with crowns 30 feet apart. With clay, these mounds are consolidated by rolling, forming a roaded watershed, directing the water through a master drain to the dam. The roaded catchment areas are an efficient method of water harvesting. In the lighter soils of the West Midlands, excellent supplies of underground water are available. Water boring equipment using the percussion drill and sludge pump are used. The sub-artesian basin is tapped at about 300 feet. At any abba, the supply of water is plentiful and the bore is usually located adjacent to several paddocks. The bore is lined with steel casing and fitted with pumping equipment and windmills. The erection of the mills is done under contract. Because of the depth, 300 feet, very large windmills are required. Water from the bores 
is pumped to the tanks by the power of the 30-foot diameter wheels and reticulated to the troughs where required. With the land prepared and pastures developing, our farms in the making are fenced and subdivided. Fence posts selected from the local timbers are prepared and dropped along the surveyed fence line. Modern boring equipment is used by contractors to make the post holes in the ground. Powered by a tractor, this machine is a great labour saver and makes a hole large enough for the post and minimise the compaction of the loose soil. The tractor also provides the power to drive the drill. The holes will take the plain galvanised wire to construct a sheath-proof fence on all farm boundaries and internal subdivisions. On the boundaries of some properties, it is necessary to build vermin-proof fences. A rabbit-proof wire netting topped with barbed wire proves effective. The wire netting to protect the pastures from the ravages of the rabbits and vermin. The barbed wire to protect the sheep flocks from destruction by the treacherous dingo. Farms are made. There is pasture and water for stock and field for grazing. Now, homes for the people. Moderately priced, yet modern homes with all the conveniences that can adequately be supplied are erected. Timber from the mills is carted over long distances. The houses, shearing and machinery sheds, dairies and stockyards are built under contract. Controlled grazing of pastures during the developmental stages is practised to advantage by the Land Settlement Authority. Here, beef cattle are being moved from one paddock to another for this purpose. Farms are handed over to the farmers in the second or third year when pastures are well established. With rural expansion, townships are established. Rocky Gully, one of the earlier projects, now has its hotel. The community spirit of a new district is strong. The Education Department, in conjunction with the Public Works, make provision for the education of the young. Children from outlying districts and farms are brought to and from school each day by bus. The progressive desire of the people to provide many of the amenities so necessary in a community. Farms are made, but success lies in good management. Many and varied are the activities of the soldier settlement scheme. Some ex-servicemen selected viticulture and received guidance and help in the processes. The various seasonal operations, like pruning, important for the next season's crop. Spraying the current vines with a weak hormone solution to set the fruit. Ploughing in the leguminous cover crop between the rows of vines. Cultivating the soil and adding to it the food necessary to produce a good harvest. Then comes the harvest, sultanas. Western Australia produces sultanas of good quality and size. Picturesque is the grape picking season. The skins of the sultanas are split by dipping the fruit into a hot solution of caustic soda. The splitting of the skins allows for proper drying. The climate of Western Australia is well suited to the growing of grapevines and the hot, dry summer for sun-kissed fruit. The application of a hormone solution to the current vines prior to the flowering season provides for the setting and increased size of fruit. This method replaces the old system of tincturing and does not interfere with the root system. Currants produced in Western Australia are of a very high quality and size. Large bunches of rich black currant grapes 
picked in season and brought to the shed to be dried on wire netting racks. Grown and ripened in the sun and dried by the warmth of the sun. Some men preferred citrus orchards. Oranges are always in constant demand and there is market for selected fruit in Singapore. Good orchard practice is introduced. Vine growing and citrus orchards are sometimes combined on the property. These activities were only a small part of the scheme of war service land settlement, yet they contribute to an important industry in the state's economy. Western Australia is naturally a primary producing country and wheat is a major crop. Excellent results have been achieved on light sandy soils. Research and wheat breeding have developed strains that will withstand rust and give a high gluten content for flour making. The soils have been built up by leguminous clover based pastures. The crops ripen in the fields and our climate is suitable for heading and harvesting. All over the countryside during the wheat harvesting season can be seen the rubber tired tractors pulling the header harvesters. Invented by an Australian, H.B. McKay, and now used the world over, these machines strip the ears from the stalks, thresh the grain from the ears, and direct the clean wheat into bins. Bulk handling of wheat is an economic practice in this country of vast areas and long distances. Many types of bulk handling equipment have been introduced. Bulk handling on the farm, bulk handling on our railways and roads, and bulk handling into the ships to feed a hungry world. The Western Australian Land Settlement Authority have made 1,334 farms from two and a quarter million acres. Widespread are the agricultural areas of Western Australia. Soil types, rainfall and locality determine land use and farm size. To maintain the economic balance of the state's productivity and to establish properties suiting the ability and agricultural choice of the applicant, the authority made farms for wheat and sheep, farms for grazing and wool growing, farms for spring lamb and baby beef, farms for viticulture and citrus fruit, farms for dairying. In the pasture areas, cereal crops usually oats, are grown for hay to augment the meadow or clover hay. When ripened, the crops are cut with a power mower. A mechanical rake then moves over the field, stacking the hay loosely into windrows. The warm summer sun cures it, making it a rich supplementary feed for livestock. The partially cured hay is then picked up by the ingenious hay baler which presses it into neat compact bales. The bales of uniform size provide for convenient storage in stacks or sheds where complete curing continues. During the late summer and autumn when the pastures and fields have been depleted this fodder of high nutritive value is distributed as required to provide a healthy well balanced diet. Ensilage, another important supplementary feed. The forage harvester mows the green pasture and elevates it to a trailer, a good fodder conservation practice. The dairying farms are made in the higher rainfall areas of the southwest. In most areas, Australia's own breed, the Illawarra Shorthorn, is preferred, particularly where whole milk is the main dairy function. Illawarra Shorthorn, chosen for their ability to yield large quantities of high-grade milk and to thrive under Australian conditions. As soon as a new dairy farm is established, continued technical advice and practical direction is given to the farmer by officers of the Department of Agriculture. Advice in the selection of cows and direction in the all-important factors of mating and breeding. 
the constant aim of every dairy farmer must be to upgrade his herd. To see that they are fed on the correct pastures and to practice wise husbandry and to diligently maintain dairy hygiene. Milk, one of the major foods of the human race. Continually must research and effort keep the flow of milk apace with the demands of world population. Bring land for export and local consumption. Another great industry in this growing state. This is one of the main activities of the Southern Project. Crossbred ewes, the progeny of British rams and merino ewes, are preferred for lamb production in Western Australia. Romney Marsh and Border Leicester rams, two of the British long wool breeds, are used to cross with the Australian merino ewes. The result of this crossbreeding produces a matron yielding a profitable annual fleece. These matrons, when mated with Southdown, Dorset Horn or other like breed of ram, yield fast growing lambs for the production of good quality meat. The lambs thrive on the prepared pastures and are usually ready for drafting and marketing at an age of 12 to 14 weeks. of the nation's primary product. The Australian wool producer is proudly jealous of the achievement in developing the merino breed. Merino sheep yield a quality and quantity of wool per sheep unequaled throughout the world. This has been the most astounding contribution to Australia's economy. On all new farms established by the authority, adequate facilities are provided for the annual shearing and handling of the wool clip. This superior method of shearing, fleece skirting, wool classing, bailing and marketing is peculiar to Australia. It has contributed in no small measure to the high reputation respected by wool buyers and wool users throughout the world. And so, farms have been made. The war service land settlement scheme has achieved its purpose. The Commonwealth and state governments, the directors and administrators, the professional and technical advisors of government departments and field offices and the workforce can be justly proud. New communities established, townships created, industry and productivity expanded and above all, families living in happiness and security.